Very fitting song for this day. Yes. Song that reminds us of the goodness of God. His act on this day reminds us of his goodness. His act on this day is because he's good. The, uh, what I mentioned earlier regarding the president, I am aware that the uh, trans day of visibility is something that's been taking place for the past 15 years. But resurrection's been celebrated for the past 2,000 years. And even for the pagans, Easter's been celebrated longer. And for the Jews, Passover's been celebrated longer. So it just seems like there would have been some consideration even though Easter is a movable holiday and no one knows if March 31st is exactly when Jesus was resurrected. But um, again, this is something that believers have been celebrating for a long time. And so there should just be some consideration and thought knowing in advance if a certain day revered by billions is going to be celebrated with something else, whatever that something else might be. So again, the world is in the condition that it's in because of he who runs the system of the world. But let's get into the word. Here's why we came. And when you decide you're going to teach a message on the subject of the resurrection, sometimes one might ask themselves, I'm sure pastors and teachers have, have asked themselves this question as I have asked myself this question numerous times, well, what else can I say about it? And of course, I'm reminded of Peter who said, as long as I'm in this tent, I'll stir you up by reminding you. So, of course, on this day, it doesn't hurt to be reminded of what we already know, since that's what we're celebrating. Anyway, I mean, we don't we don't mind being reminded on our birthday that it's our birthday. Some of us are like, remind me as much as you like. But I thought, is there anything unique I could do today as we remember and are reminded of the resurrection, the sacrifice of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ? And so go to John 10, just find John 10. And I want to start off differently. I want us to walk away this resurrection with, with a defense, with, with an answer for what we call our hope, for what we say we believe in. And so I'm going to start off with a few images. And from these images, we'll navigate, we'll traverse the terrain of this particular lesson. But if you could put up that, that first image. And I'm not sure if I gave you all a particular order, but you can just put them up in the order in which you received them. Ah, yes. What is this pagan iconography and why are we looking at it on Resurrection Sunday? Well, I'll tell you why. This is the god known as Tammuz. Tammuz was a Mesopotamian deity, Damuzid he was also known as. 
the Babylonians worshipped him, the Assyrians worshipped him, the Sumerians worshipped him. He was also known as Adon by the Canaanites. How many of you have heard of Adonai, our Lord? Well, Adonai comes from Adon. And this deity was a shepherd god. He was an agricultural deity. And what is also unique about him is that in some myths, he is said to have been the son of Nimrod, who we all know was the first anti-God figure in the world. Also, he was worshipped about 4,000 years before the birth of Christ. About 4,000 years before the birth of Christ. P put up that next image, please. This is a goddess by the name of Inyana, which she is more commonly known as Ishtar. And there are many who believe that Easter comes from Ishtar, not necessarily so, but Ishtar also was a fertility goddess. She was the consort or wife of the previous god, Tammuz, the image you saw before. And she too was worshipped by the same people groups I mentioned about 4,000 years before the birth of Christ. Let's put up the third image, please. This is the Egyptian god Osiris. Osiris was the husband of Isis. Isis was known as the queen of heaven, one of the many queens of heaven worshipped in the old world. Today, the queen of heaven is known as Mary, mother of Jesus. But this is Osiris, who with Isis gave birth to their child, Horus. Many of you have seen the eye of Horus before. And Osiris was worshipped about 1,500 plus years before the birth of Christ. He was a god of the dead and a god of the afterlife. Next image, please. This is the... Greek god known as Adonis, Adonis, and that same Adon that we're familiar with in Adonai, the Greeks worshiped this god of, of beauty, this god of desire, and many of you have heard the term Adonis applied to beautiful men. Worshipped about 450 years before the birth of Christ. And of course, the Adonis, the Adon comes from the Adon worshipped by the Canaanites almost 3,500 years earlier. Final image, please. This is the image of Baal or Baal, specifically Baal Hadad, the Lord of the Storm. He almost looks like he's, he, he's, he's putting up black power if you, <laughs> if you look closely at his fists. But nevertheless, this is one of the many bales. They're, they're all throughout the scriptures. We know the issues that the children of Israel had with the bales or Baals. And this is Baal Hadad. Baal is simply a, a, a title of honor, meaning Lord. And then the title would be applied to a number of different deities. This was probably the most common and most popular Baal worship, Baal Hadad, the Lord of the Storm. Worshipped anywhere from one year to 4,000 years before the birth of Christ. Now, why did I show you all these images? Why did I bring them up today on this particular celebratory Sunday. I mean, this Sunday is about Jesus. This Sunday is about the resurrection, the fact that he is risen, the fact that he has defeated death. 
and through his sacrifice has reconciled us back to God. Why am I bringing up these false deities, these pagan deities? Well, every image that you saw was known in antiquity as a dying and rising deity. Gods who died and were then raised. Now, what might a naysayer do with that kind of information? They'd be quick to tell you, you know, the Jesus that you worship and the belief regarding his resurrection was practiced by others thousands of years before. In an attempt to do what? To discredit the validity of the resurrection of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, this kind of information wasn't really discussed from pulpits 20, 30, 40 years ago. But with the advent of the Internet and the advent of social media platforms and the rapid pace at which information can travel, I have seen with my own eyes, I've seen people question the faith because of information like this. I've seen people leave the faith, depart the faith, because they believe that what they have been believing up until this point in time was something that their parents or their guardians forced them to believe and, and didn't reveal the whole truth to them or they didn't know the truth to reveal it to them. We're going to lay out some facts and then we're going to lay out the absolute truth. Because sometimes a fact can be that you told a lie. But absolute truth stands the test of time. So we're going to address some facts, and then we're going to hit you with the absolute truth. Again, think about it just for a second. Imagine if you weren't as grounded in the faith as you are right now. And someone tells you that Jesus' tale has been told before. It's nothing new. It's not original. It was borrowed from heathens. That might bother you a bit. You might become insecure in what it is that you believe. How then do we respond to it? Peter, of course, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 said, be ready to give a defense. Be ready to give an answer. Be, be ready to give a reason an explanation for that which you believe, that which you call your hope, be ready to do so. Well, not everyone is ready. And, and one of the instructions that I specifically receive from the Lord is to equip saints with answers. Now, I don't have all the answers, but what I do have, I'm going to give to you. Again, these were deities that were said to have died. Some, some question those who believe that and say, no, some just disappeared in their mythologies or some who were reborn actually never died. But nevertheless, their tales are these gods worshipped by these ancient peoples were gods who died and were then raised. That sounds like my savior. Who's copying who? Now, I know what your response is from your heart, but how do you know? John 10, are you there? John 10, verse 11, what does Jesus say here? I am, I am the good shepherd. Remember, I told you that first image of Tammuz. By the way, in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14, God was highly upset with the children of Israel because they were weeping for Tammuz. To weep for Tammuz was to honor him, was to adore him, was to worship him. And the children of Israel were doing, it, doing that in the book of Ezekiel, and the prophet Ezekiel had, had to 
reprimand them on behalf of God. That, that Tammuz, remember, was worshipped as a shepherd God. Jesus says here in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Okay, well, there's something that's already slightly different than whatever these previous pagan gods had done. This man, Jesus, isn't just dying to die, but he's dying in order to give his life for others. Verse 12 says, but a hireling. What's a hireling? Somebody who's been hired. A hired servant, a wage worker. A hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and does what? Scatters them. The hireling flees because he's been hired. He doesn't care about the sheep. What does Jesus say in verse 14? I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I say amen to that. Amen. But wait a minute now. These ancient Mesopotamian people were already worshiping a shepherd God who died and was raised. Is that where Jesus got that from? Remember, I'm going to hit you with the facts and then hit you with the absolute truth. truth. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. Find verse 1. When you have it, say, I have it. Here, Peter, final chapter of his first epistle, writes, the elders who are among you, the pastors who are among you, I exhort, I who am a what? Fellow elder. Literally translates into co-pastor. In other words, I pastor side by side with other pastors. I shepherd side by side with other shepherds. He says, I who am a fellow elder and a, watch this, listen to what he says now. He says, and I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Verse 2, elders, I commission you to shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers or bishops, but not by compulsion. Rather do it willingly and don't do it for what? Dishonest gain, but do it eagerly. Don't be lords over those entrusted to you, but be examples to the flock and win the boss man. The, the chief shepherd. There's only one chief shepherd. Amen. Talked about this last week. Uh, shepherd is poimen in the Greek. Archie poimen is chief shepherd. There's only one chief. The rest of us who claim to be pastors called to the Lord's church, pastors called to the Lord's ministry, we are under shepherds submitted to the chief shepherd. It says, and when the chief shepherd appears, this is talking about the appearing of the Lord, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. And when will I receive that crown? When the Lord appears and I've been resurrected. When we're resurrected, we make our way to the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema, the reward bench, to give an account for the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Thank God we're saved. And thank God those of us who appear at the judgment seat are those of us who made it in. 
We don't get to the judgment seat to find out if we make it in. There's a whole lot of foolish thinking about what happens when we get to heaven. Will Peter let us in? Again, I ask the question, who gave Peter that job? No, 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 no. You secure your position in heaven here in the earth. And you secure it before you die. If you've been born again, I'll see you at the reward bench. That's a line worth standing in. Look at this. Peter called Jesus the what? The chief shepherd. But wait a minute. This Tammuz God was worshipped 4,000 years before the birth of Christ as a shepherd God who died and was then raised. Let's keep going. Look at Mark 8. Verse 31. And it reads, and he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be what? Killed. And after how many days? Three days would do what? Rise again. Killed three days, rise again. This is what Jesus said. That second image I showed you of the goddess Inanna. She's known as Asherah, Astarte, Ishtar, numerous names. There's a tale in which she descends into the underworld and dies for guess how many days and nights? Three days and three nights. 4,000 years before the birth of Christ. Is that where Christ got that from? Let's keep going. Look at John 11. Find verse 23. John eleven twenty three. Jesus said to her, her being who? Martha. Oh, Martha, don't you weep. <laughs> Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. And the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Congregation, do you believe this? I believe it. Would you believe that I believe this? Would you believe that after knowing that gods like Tammuz and Inanna were worshipped 4,000 years before the birth of Christ, these gods and goddesses died and were raised and descended into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, way before Christ ever showed up on the scene, way before there ever was a church. After knowing that, I still believe what Jesus says. I wonder why I do. Because I have a reason and I have an answer. Now, some might say, you don't need to bother with a reason. You don't need to bother with an answer. Just believe what you believe. And to a degree, I understand that. But what if I can find an answer? What if the answer or the reason or the hope that I discover can cause others to join the flock of God? Isn't it ultimately about preaching the ministry of reconciliation? and saving souls. So, what do we do with this? What do we do with those who want to discredit our faith? They want to discredit our Jesus. They want to discredit our Bible. They want to discredit the church. Question the validity of all these things. 
How do we respond to that? Here's how. Make your way to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And this happens to be Resurrection Sunday. So our focus is on the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. If it was around December, we would have been celebrating the birth, which by the way, many of these gods and other gods whose tales were told before the birth of Christ also have stories of, guess what, virgin births. Oh, you Jesus worshipers, you don't know what you're, you're really worshiping Tammuz. You're worshiping Osiris. That's been told before. The, the, the founders of the church stole that from ancient Egyptian religion and ancient Mesopotamian religion. Did they? Are you in Genesis chapter 3? Yes. How do I deal with the fact that everything I showed you on these images, in these images, and everything that I informed you of the gods in these images is true. It's fact. These were gods worshipped by ancient peoples, and these were their stories. These were the accounts that supported their worship. Those are facts. What do I do with those facts as a Jesus believer? Are you in Genesis chapter 3? Okay. How many of you know that the devil is an idiot? <laughs> Raise your hand. Raise your hand high. Okay. Now, simultaneously, how many of you know that even though he's an idiot, he's a genius? Yeah, he is. He's been around a lot longer than you and I. He's got ancient knowledge. But he's a dumb spirit. But he's brilliant. But he's stupid. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. The Bible gives us glimpses of his brilliance and his insight and possibly even gives us glimpses of how close he was to God. Remember, he was the anointed cherub who covered. The worship of God by other celestials and angels was brought to him, and he took that worship to God. He was perfect in all his ways, said God till iniquity was found in him. He was very close to God, wasn't he? He was, he was a high-ranking chief prince. So that means there were some things he had access to that maybe other angels didn't. Now, because of his stupid brilliance, there were some things he was able to either know or deduce, which by accumulating this information, he was able to then move forward with perversions of truth. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. Now, what has happened up until this point? Uh, Adam and the woman, they got busted. And, and what does the man say to God when God questions him about his wrong decision? The woman you gave me. What a way to model husbanding to all men that would follow. Blame God for the woman he gave you. That's definitely, husbands take notes on what not to do. 
He then turns to the woman, and what does the woman do? Well, she plays the blame game too, the serpent. Oh, you mean the creature you had dominion over? The creature you were in charge of? The creature who was supposed to be submitted to your rule that I gave you? You talking about that serpent? And then we get to verse 14, and God turns his attention to the serpent. Listen very carefully to what he says. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Now, this was not some serpent that just had his own random agenda. No, 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 no. The book of Revelation in chapter 20, when the devil is imprisoned in the bottomless pit by some unnamed angel who's clearly a bad somebody. The Bible calls that devil the serpent of old. Which means that either the devil influenced the serpent or transformed into a serpent. Bottom line, the serpent is the devil. And so what is God saying to the serpent? What he's saying to the devil. That's what he's saying to the serpent. What he's saying to the devil is what he's saying to the serpent. Again, because you've done this, you're cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I, God, will put enmity, which means hostility and hatred. I will put enmity between who? You and the woman. Who's the you? He's talking to the serpent. He's talking to the devil. So he's saying, I'm going to put enmity between you, devil, you accuser, you adversary, between you, serpent, and the woman. Who's the woman? Hmm. You're all right. Yeah, it's Eve in the sense that she's the mother of all living. You could take it a step further and refer to the woman as Sarah, the mother of Israel. You could refer to the woman as Israel or more specifically, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Bottom line, what is God saying? I'm going to put enmity, hostility, and hatred between you, Satan, you, devil, and the woman. Let's keep reading. And I'm going to put that same enmity, that same hostility, and that same hatred between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. Oh, wait a minute. Let me back up two lines. Did I read this correctly? And did the devil hear this correctly? That enmity would be put between his seed and her seed. Yeah, he heard that. And the devil knew what seed meant. The devil knew what the seed of the woman meant. Therefore, he knew that progeny, that offspring would come into the world and that offspring would be responsible for crushing his head. So the devil, in his stupid brilliance, realized, oh, wait a minute, we're dealing with the birth of somebody. We're dealing with the birth of a specific line. Okay, now wait a minute, wait a minute. If that seed is born into this world via a man, that seed will be born into sin. That seed couldn't save anyone. So the seed, whoever it is, has to get here without the aid of a man. The devil knew that because he was the one responsible for sin being in the world. Now, how do we know that the devil has insight or is aware of things that the biblical record doesn't let us know he's aware of? All I got to do is back up to the beginning of Genesis chapter 3. Take a look at this. Look at verse 1. 
Here's all the proof we need. It says the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. Was the serpent more cunning because the Lord made the serpent more cunning? Or was this serpent more cunning because it was the devil? The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, why is the serpent bringing this up? Why is the serpent questioning me about God and therefore questioning God? The serpent said to the woman, has God indeed said? That's his M.O., saints, to cast doubt on what God has said. You know God has said it. You read it. And the serpent still comes to ask you this same question, has God indeed said? Has God indeed said that it's not good for man to be alone? Has God indeed said, by his stripes you were healed? Has God indeed said, give and it shall be given to you? This is what he's been doing since day one. Casting doubt on what God has said. So here he is doing it again. Has God, or this is the first time he does it, with mankind. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. God never said, don't touch it. He said, don't eat it. It can be a danger to add to God's word. Verse four, look at what the serpent says. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Hold up. Who is this serpent to tell this woman? What did he say? But but the woman has already established that God has said, if you eat it, you'll surely die. The devil follows up with a, you will not surely die. Where did he get that from? Is he lying or is he telling a truth couched in lies? Is is he giving, is he laying out a fact with the purpose of deceiving? Because we know how the account goes. We know that when they eat, they don't physically die, but they do spiritually die, which then leads to physical death. But what's the devil doing right here? Oh, no, you're not going to drop dead. You won't surely die. And then watch this. Look at what he says in verse 5. For God knows. Oh, serpent, you know what God knows? God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, pause right there. And just go on over to the 22nd verse of this same chapter. We already know what happens. The devil said what he said. They disobey. God pronounces the consequences of that disobedience. And then look here in verse 22 of the same third chapter of Genesis. Then the Lord God said, behold, The man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Wait a minute. Did God just say what the devil said would happen? Yeah. So our question is, how did the devil know? There are a number of reasons. Oh, watch this why the devil stated a fact. It was a fact that in the day in which they ate of that fruit, they would become like God to know good and evil. 
this tells us a number of things. Number one, God never intended for man to be like him to know good and evil. He only intended for man to be like him to know him. God never intended for man to know good or evil. God intended for man to know God. And see, God is absolute good. Again, back to facts and absolute truth. Back to what could be true and what could be a lie. It could be true you told a lie. But that's not absolute truth. Yes, God is good. But what could be good to one person may not be good to someone else. But God is absolute good, just like God is absolute truth. So the devil to the woman says something that is true. God confirms it in the same chapter. God says man has eaten the fruit and he has now become like one of us to know good and evil again. How did the devil know that would be the case? Either God told him in eternity past because he was God's right hand, right hand, chief of the angels, chief of the cherubim, chief of the celestials. That could be a reason that he knew or because Every angel has the life of God in them. And while every angel isn't as old as God, they're older than the earth. They've been around a long time. They know how the cosmos works. They can't create the cosmos. They can't sustain the cosmos, but they know how it works. Again, the devil is a genius. He's a dumb spirit, but he's a genius. So is it possible that the devil either A, was informed by God earlier, maybe before his fall, that that would happen, or because of his celestial brilliance, he was able to deduce, because I'm telling you right now, he was able to deduce that some woman in the earth had to have a virgin birth in order for a seed to come through that woman and save the rest of mankind. The moment he heard this proclamation that I'm going to put enmity between your seed, serpent seed, seed of Satan, and the seed of the woman, which would be the seed of God, he knew a man can't be involved in this because a man would cause that seed to be born into sin. And that seed being born into sin couldn't save anyone else from sin. So he said, here's what I'll do. I'll start telling the story before it actually happens. I'll have ancient people worship gods who showed up by way of virgin birth. I will start having people worship gods who died and were then raised. So that by the time the seed shows up, there will be those who question his validity. But we see where he got it from. He got it from God. The only reason he knew anything about a seed is because God said there would be a seed. And therefore, he could begin his false tales. He could begin his, his false narratives. He could begin his false stories being told thousands of years before our Savior showed up. But see, one of the things that he probably forgot to consider is that Jesus showing up through the womb of a woman is not the first time he's on the scene. He probably also, just for a brief moment, forgot that the only reason he's in existence is because of the power that would later on become flesh. Because the Bible says all things were made by him, for him, and through him. That means regardless of Jesus coming via flesh thousands of years after the Garden of Eden, 
You don't have an Eden unless you have Jesus of eternity past. You don't have a devil unless you have Jesus of eternity past. If you don't have the Logos who became flesh, the word who was there in the beginning with God and all things were made through him, you'd have no Eden, you'd have no tree, you'd have no fruit, you'd have no Adam, you'd have no Satan, you'd have no serpent. So again, what does the devil hear? Seed. Seed. I've got to pollute seed. I've got to pervert seed. I've got to pervert the account of the seed. I've got to pollute the myth of the seed. I've got to pervert this account so that when the seed shows up, yes, there will be those who believe in him, but there will be those who don't, not just because they choose to reject, but because they try to apply their intellect to something that your intellect can't comprehend. Okay, look here now in Acts chapter 1. Again, every God I showed you, every image I showed you were gods who existed in time past. I mean, they still exist today, but... But, but the old gods aren't worshipped like they used to be worshipped in, in, in antiquity. But these are entities, these are gods and goddesses that existed that were worshipped by these ancient people groups. That's a fact. It is a fact that these were gods who were considered dying and rising gods. That's a fact. And that even some of them were said to have been born of a virgin. That's a fact. It doesn't mean that their tales or their stories or their accounts are the absolute truth. Okay, watch this. Acts chapter 1. Look at the first verse. It reads, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering. I want to stop right there for just a second. Luke is responsible for writing the book of Acts. So what Luke says in his opening is, the former account I made. What was the former account? The gospel according to Luke. If you look at the opening of Luke's gospel account, he's addressing the same man, Theophilus. Now he's addressing Theophilus again saying what? The former account I made of all that Jesus began both to what? Do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive. What's he saying? He presented himself alive after he died. Now, how could he do that? Only by the power of God. Now, there would be some who would say, this is fiction that is no different than any other kind of mythology. An atheist would say that, maybe even an agnostic who, who, who doesn't deny the existence of a God but doesn't know who God is. But they may read this and say, this is just as fanciful as the tale of Hercules. And if you weren't a believer in this, you might think the same thing because there's some fanciful stuff that we read in the scriptures. There's some supernatural science fiction type stuff that we read about in the scriptures. But we believe it all happened because we believe Jesus is real. So what is Luke saying? Luke is saying he presented himself after he had died. He presented himself alive after his suffering by, watch this, many Many, not just many proofs, but many infallible proofs. What's the difference between a proof and an infallible proof? 
Proof can be tainted. Proof can be altered. But when proof is infallible, it's undeniable. Fallible would be you and I. Man is fallible. God is infallible. Man's word is fallible. God's word is infallible. So what does Jesus do? Jesus goes the extra mile to establish the validity of his experience. By doing what? By presenting himself alive after he suffered, after he died, after he was resurrected by numerous undeniable, infallible proofs. Evidence you can't argue with. The only way you can argue with it is if you weren't there. But the problem with arguing with it because you're not there is that there's a text that has credibility to it because it's a text that makes the time and effort to reference historical peoples, historical sightings, and historical occurrences. And in the midst of all of these historical things, there are infallible proofs that Jesus did die, that he was raised, and that he did present himself to his disciples after. Okay, let's keep going. Watch this. Presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. See, what they didn't have at their disposal in this day were these. Because here's the reality. They would have saw him die. They would have saw him buried. They would have then realized that his tomb is empty. They would have come up with their reasons as to why his tomb was empty. But there would have been smartphone proof that he was walking around amongst people after his so-called death. It couldn't have been denied. Some might have said that's editing. Some might have said, that's cap cut. That's iMovie. Those are editing apps. That's not really him on your phone. Because the devil's going to always make sure that even in the face of infallible proof, there are those who still deny. That there are those who still deny. Do you know that atheists, atheists, deny the existence of God, meaning they deny the existence of an intelligent designer. They rather go the route of Big Bang, which is a what? A chance explosion. And they rather go by a theory of evolution, which was a chance mutation. By chance, watch this, an explosion occurred in nothingness And the result of the explosion, for the first time ever, was order. I never seen something blow up and cause order. There was an explosion and there wasn't any debris. There weren't any casualties. Rather, there was a planet called Earth perfectly distanced from the sun, 93 million miles, so that it doesn't burn up or it doesn't freeze. That all happened by chance. (laughs) That's what they would rather believe. That's what they choose to believe. And you can look this up. Here's something that they can't explain. It's a number. 1.5 1.5 something, I forget the rest. But it's called the divine proportion. You want to know why they call it the divine proportion? Because they keep finding the number everywhere in creation. They find it in length. They find it in distance. They find it in width. They can't explain why this no- It's called the golden ratio. The divine proportion. Even the atheists have to acknowledge that this number exists and there is a higher probability that intelligence created this as opposed to chance. Jesus did what? He presented himself by not just one proof, but by many infallible proofs. Let's take it a step further. 
Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. See, all these gods that supposedly died and were raised, the only evidence that people have are written records, written historical records per civilization. Whereas with Jesus, you don't just have written records, you have eyewitnesses. You have eyewitnesses. Watch this. Luke just brought up the fact that the 12 apostles saw him. We also know Mary Magdalene saw him too. So Luke is referring to a small number of individuals that saw him during his 40 days. But Paul takes it a step further. He takes it a step further. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 1. He says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to, to you, which also you received, and it's the same gospel you're standing in. You're standing in it because you believed it. By which also you're saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. He's saying what? If your belief was empty, if your belief was fruitless, then there's a good chance you're not holding fast to the word. That word that was preached, that you said you believe, that you're now standing in. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. That what? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried. Okay. There was a man named Jesus who lived, who was crucified by the Roman Empire, who died and was buried. He was placed in a tomb paid for by Joseph of Arimathea. And you can go to Israel now and you can go to Joseph's garden where the tomb is and the tomb is empty. It's empty. Uh, grave diggers probably stole the body. Okay, I guess that's a possible option. Let's keep reading. Verse 3 again, I delivered to you first. We'll finish, we'll finish here in verse 8. I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. Now, there may have been some back then that didn't believe. I mean, we know they actually went to Caiaphas and said, yeah, they took the body. But they also remember that he said, I will be killed and be raised the third day. He was seen, uh, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas. Then he was seen by all 12 of them. Who's Cephas? Peter. Cephas is another name for Peter. So what's Paul saying here? Paul is saying that he was seen by Peter, an apostle of the Lamb. Then he was seen by all 12 apostles of the Lamb. Okay, well, you know, the apostles might be lying for him. You know, the apostles may be the ones he specifically told. Matter of fact, he probably told him secretly, you know, I'm not really going to die. I'm going to just go in here. I'm going to lay down for a little bit. <laughs> then I'm going to get up. I'm going to leave. You all know what to tell everybody else. <laughs> but here's the problem. He wasn't just seen by the 12. Verse 6. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren. Oh, at once. Man, that's a lot of lying if all 500 are lying. That's a lot of work and a lot of effort to go through. Do you see that? Right now we're at 512 eyewitnesses. Why take the time to record this in this book of fiction? Why go through all of that? Because it's not fiction. Because it happened. Again. Oh, okay. I'm trying, I'm trying to wrap this up. There's a movie that just recently came out. It's called Dune. 
Dune Part 2. Yes. Movie was fire. Oh my gosh. In this movie, and in part one, there was talk of a Messiah, right? The boy from the other world. Sound familiar to you? The young child from another world? The Lasan al Gaib, that's what they called him, the Messiah. And they were trying to, in one scene, figure out how they can snuff out this Messiah and his following. And they were coming up with ideas like, why don't we kill him? And the emperor's daughter said, no, don't do that. Prophets get stronger when they die. He started coming up with all of these things, these ways by which maybe we can snuff out this following and, and no good idea was being presented. It reminds me of Gamaliel when the Pharisees were complain, complaining about the gospel that Peter and John were preaching. And so Gamaliel with his wisdom said, don't y'all remember them other dudes that claimed to be the Messiah? One of them happened to be Judas of Galilee, a different Judas. And he mentioned two names and he said, you know, they had a big following, but when they died, their followers scattered and the movement ceased to exist. So you would think then that, oh, here's the pattern. If somebody shows up saying, I'm the Messiah, follow me. I am your path to freedom and victory. When that so-called prophet or Messiah dies, his followers should then scatter and there should be no more talk of the followers, the figure, or their beliefs. What was Gamaliel saying? He was saying, if this Jesus is fake, if he's false, then as a result of his death, his followers should scatter and there should be no more talk of his message. Now Gamaliel gave that wise counsel about 1900 years ago. Do you see where I'm going with this? I have to ask myself the question of all the Messiah figures that have ever existed in history, how is it that the Jesus fella still has his followers 2000 years later? Shouldn't his message by now have been snuffed out? Shouldn't his followers by now have been scattered? Even with all the sin in the church and the division in the church and the witchcraft in the church, the church is still standing. Isn't that interesting? So again, what does Paul say here? He was seen by Cephas. Then he was seen by Cephas' homies. <laughs> After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Oh, wow. Wait a minute. Then it says this. After that, he was seen by James. That's 513. And then by all the apostles, all the apostles, wait, you mean beyond the 12? Oh, right. Cause there were 14 more. There were 14 more, 13 more, more specifically, if you don't include Paul. So what was he saying? He was saying, he was saying the 12, then the 500, then James, then the other 12 apostles who weren't foundational apostles, but they were still apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says what? Then he says, then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. What's Paul saying here? Paul is saying, unlike the other apostles, I was, my term went longer. I was born later. Paul saw Jesus, but he didn't see Jesus the way the 12 saw Jesus. The 12 saw Jesus amongst the 40 days. Paul saw Jesus later as he's making his way to Damascus to persecute Christians. But he had a legit encounter with the Lord Jesus and he saw him and the Lord in that moment called him to apostleship, to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Again, why would Luke and why would Paul 
make all this effort to mention eyewitnesses because they're lying? Okay, well, this is an easy fix. If Paul and Luke are lying about what they wrote in this historical book, then I shouldn't believe any historical book. If the Bible's lying, then every book written in history is lying. All the history books that you opened up in school, they're all liars. They're all filled with lies. And if the Bible's lying, well, shoot, you know the Book of Mormon is lying, and you know the, you know the Quran is lying. You know the Jehovah's Witness Bible is lying. They're all lying if the Bible's lying. I hope you understand where I'm going with this. What would be the point in mentioning infallible proofs? What would be the point in listing eyewitnesses? And again, look at the fruit of the seed our Savior sowed when he died. We are still here, still standing as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the earth today. His followers didn't scatter. They weren't snuffed out. What does that say about him as it relates to the others? You don't have big followings until after Jesus. You don't have the big followings before. Oh, yeah, you might be thinking, well, what, about, uh, what about Gautama? He founded Buddhism. There's still Buddhists here. There's a whole lot of them. But they pale in comparison to believers, to Christians in the earth room. Well, what about Muhammad? Well, he came after Jesus. And Muhammad built his prophecies and his words on the back of Jesus. The Quran says more about Jesus than Muhammad. Most Muslims don't know that because they don't read their Quran just like most Christians don't read their Bible. <laughs> That's just fact. I didn't say it was absolute truth, but it is fact. So, after presenting all of this, I still believe in this man because I know he's the real deal. I know it. I know it by way of history. I know it by way of the fact that the devil had to tell false tales before he got here to try to quiet him before he rose up. And it didn't work, did it? But you know how I really know that this man had to have lived, had to have died. He had to have conquered death. He had to have been resurrected, and he had to have ascended to the right hand of the Father. I don't just know it because the Bible says it, and I don't just know it because Luke and Paul presented many infallible proofs, but I know it for myself. And this is the one thing you can't take away from Fred. And it only takes one time for it to happen. When it happens one time, I'm locked in. I had the nerve and the audacity and the unmitigated gall to go to this God in heaven in the name of Jesus and pray for something specific, and it showed up. Yeah. Have you ever done that? Yeah. Have you ever petitioned the Father in the name of Jesus and what you petitioned for manifested? Yeah. Don't you know heaven is under no obligation to recognize a name it hasn't given authority to? Which means that when you pray to the Father who's in heaven in the name of his son Jesus, heaven recognizes that name. They don't recognize any other names. You can't be praying to Mary. You can't be praying to angels. You can't be praying to Paul. You can't be praying to Peter. You only pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. And when you pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, I'm telling you, the worst thing that can happen is the best thing that can happen. When you see results, you can't talk me out of it. You can't talk me out of it. You can try to, to demonize. You can try to, to reduce the validity. You can try to tell me this has been told before, but I told y'all why it's been told before. You can try to tell me whatever you want to tell me about this Jesus not really being the Savior, not really being a man of power, only being a historical figure who lived just like any other historical figure. Yeah, that part is true, but he wasn't just man. He was God. And again, I know he was God. Why? Because when I worship him, I get results. When I pray, I get results. When I touch and agree, I get results. Do you get results? 
Have you touched and agreed and gotten results? Have you lifted up holy hands? Have you exalted his name? Have you magnified and got results? Then not a soul on this planet, even your pastor, should be able to talk you out of your Jesus. Happy resurrection, everybody. Father, we thank you.